Please join me in the opening prayer. Loving God, come and speak to our hearts today. May we, like those on the Emmaus Road, find your words burning with hope in our lives. Strengthen us and give us courage for the journey ahead. For we pray in Christ's name, amen. Our Psalter reading is from Psalm chapter 116, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 19. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. will call on the name of the Lord, always and ever, as long as I live. What shall I give for his bounty to me, but to pay my vows in the presence of all his people? I am your servant, Lord. Always and ever, as long as I live, I will call on the name of the Lord. I will call on the name of the Lord. Good morning and welcome to Church on the Couch. This is the third week of Easter and this is actually our sixth service of Church on the Couch since we've been apart. And again, I am uh, so pleased to be joined by others. Susan Candy, who is the organist and choir director at Pennville United Methodist Church. 
Diana Gardner, who has been assisting us with music. And I'm so grateful for our musicians, uh, for the work of uh, Susan and Diana and Lisa Kisselstein, who has uh, joined us in previous weeks. And today we uh, welcome Karen Fuller, who is serving as liturgist. So welcome, Karen. We have so many things in our hearts, both joys and concerns this day. And because we're apart, we've been receiving the personal prayers via email, and we've been doing it that way and not naming names. But I know that you all have names on your heart, and I know you have joys that uh, you are looking so forward to celebrating when we're in person. I imagine that's going to go on a while, and I look forward to that. And we have many concerns. And of course, as uh, this pandemic continues across our nation, we continue to pray for all those who are sick and uh, for the many families that are grieving uh, deep losses. We continue to pray for all those on the front line. And we pray for each one who's been impacted by this. And we all look forward to a time when we can all be together again. Let us take all of those joys and all of the concerns and let us bring them uh, to God in prayer this morning. Let us pray. O oh God of unlimited grace, we come to you this day grateful for the day, ready to worship you. Gather us in, O oh God. Bring us to a place of worship and peace. Lord God, we come to you as a joyful people, as people always ready to celebrate, happy for uh, all sorts of milestones in our lives and good news that happens and occurs in our lives every day. And Lord God, we come to you ready as a hurting people, as people ready for your healing touch. We pray for those who are in hospitals and in nursing homes, we pray for those who are separated from us for this time. And we pray that all those who are feeling a sense of isolation will know your loving presence. And Lord God, we pray for one another. We pray for each one affected, those who are without jobs at this time, those who have found themselves on the front line working in hospitals or even doing deliveries and putting themselves at a higher risk than others during this time of uh, pandemic crisis. And Lord God, we come to you as Easter people, ready to cry out with joy that he is risen, he is risen indeed. But we also come to you as a people who still have some doubt. We come to you as people who sometimes have some distraction. And we come to you as a people who sometimes are overwhelmed. And we know that you, oh God, carry our troubles. Take those issues and we give them to you. And pray that we don't take them back, but we lay, lay them at your feet. And Lord God, on this Sunday, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear our prayers, dear Lord, from our faintest supplication to our cries of pain. Hear our prayers, dear Lord. Give us hope and strength to with your love rise again.
The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 27. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. The second gospel reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Holy words, holy wisdom. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Fall fresh on each one of us gathered here so that both speaker and hearer, will know your will for us today. Amen. I have read these gospel passages from Luke a lot over the years, and I suppose we always see something different based on what's happening in our life at the moment. But this time, the words, but we had hoped, don't just stand out. I said them a few minutes ago. And I've been saying those words for over a month. But we had hoped aren't just words full of disappointment that were spoken along the dirty road of Emmaus by these two followers of Jesus. These are words we can relate to. These are our words. It's pretty easy these days to be discouraged. 
In every conversation, no matter how positive, we all speak with a tinge of disappointment because our life today is nothing like our life was a few weeks ago. There are places we cannot go. There are people we cannot see. And even places we do go are just out of necessity. And now we have to wear protective gear to go to those places. And disappointment isn't just one of the is just one of the emotions that we're feeling. We're sad. We're anxious, and at times we're even angry, wondering how did we get to this place. There's a part of me that has tried to downplay any disappointment, especially in front of the congregation. I want to be careful to be positive. And I want to be careful to be reassuring. But I also want to be careful to be honest. And reading this passage this week has made me realize that disappointment is part of the process. And so is talking about it. Those followers of Jesus are heading out of Jerusalem defeated. The teacher that they had followed and believed in was dead. And now they believe that everything that they had hoped for was over. Of course, this story could have ended there, but, it, but we know that it didn't. Because while they were talking, this apparent stranger joins them on the walk. And to their surprise, he knows nothing of the events that just occurred. So they share not just the details, but their feelings of deep disappointment. And it will be a while before they realize it's Jesus. But something really important happens first. Before Jesus interprets scripture for them, and even before Jesus breaks bread with them, Jesus walks alongside those grieving followers and asks them to name their loss doesn't dismiss their disappointment or even try to correct any misunderstandings that they have. He hears them and he gives them the space that they need to grieve. And that's when they're able to name it. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, they said. Few things are more painful than dashed hopes. And the grief that they are feeling in that moment is very real. By listening to them and by inviting them to name their disappointment and allowing them to sit in their grief, if you will, Jesus gave them room, actually gave them space to now see Jesus where they never expected Jesus would be, right there with them on the road. Not just alive, but present with them in their midst. And it was then, and only then, that they could move to the next place, which was for them the ability to now proclaim this good news of Jesus' resurrection. And then they would begin to build Christ's church. But first, all Jesus had to do is show up and listen. And let them name their pain. It is difficult to sit in grief and name pain or disappointment. And it's sometimes hard to watch and listen as others do it. But it's really important that space is allowed for that. Because friends, we need to grieve. We need to be able to express our pain and disappointment, our fears and our anxieties. We all really need to sit in, for a moment in our grief. Because when we're given that space for that, we can then experience grace and soon discover that those things have less of a hold on us than we thought they did. And that's where we get to be surprised by God's presence. 
by God's incredible love for us, it's then that we begin to move to a new place. It's then that we can really begin to have a fresh start. Now, some of the followers' disappointment was because they had misunderstood God's work in their midst. Expecting a warrior, they got a suffering servant. But misunderstandings aside, their pain and grief were very real. We have all heard, and we've all most likely said those four words. But we had hoped. We had hoped it would turn out differently. We had hoped that that job would work out. We had hoped that that treatment would be successful. We had hoped that that relationship would be repaired. However that sentence ends for you, and whatever the circumstance, it is important that you have the space to name it. Years ago, I learned that in crisis, usually in hospitals or at the time of someone's passing, no one is looking for a particular wisdom or certain words. They appreciate my presence and they are looking for space. Space to allow them to experience God's grace. Just a few days ago, I began to write down some of my thoughts about this crisis just for my own eyes. And I've been pretty vocal about my disappointment, especially about missing Holy Week and not celebrating Easter with you in the church. But I realized in my writing that there was a lot of grief about this that I had not expressed, that I had not dealt with. I had been grumbling, but I had not really allowed myself to sit in that pain or grief. So I started naming them, all the closures, all the activities were that were suspended that I've been grieving. I named the people who I can no longer see during this whole thing. I came to terms with the fact that the Lenten lunches, luncheons ended too soon. We didn't get to host ours here. I've come to terms with the fact that I can't go to hospitals. I can't see people in nursing homes. And I couldn't spend Easter with my family. And I grieved. You would think that listing those things made it worse, but it didn't because I finally named them. I finally was able to spend some time sitting in that grief. And now I am able to see things differently just like those followers on the road to Emmaus that day. Over the week, I've experienced grace in ways I really hadn't before. Over the weeks, I've also experienced community in ways I really hadn't before. When we had to close on March 15th, I dreaded what being apart was going to look like and what it was going to mean. And I couldn't imagine being away for more than two or three weeks. And I don't know what I trusted less the power of the church connection, or the power of God's grace. And I found out that both are strong and both are interconnected. Well, being apart has created some complications. It has also showered us with blessings. Before we closed, I rarely ever went on YouTube. We now have a channel. And we're attracting over 100 views a week for worship. And we're doing more services together than we've ever done. We have coffee and conversation weekly over Zoom, which is a video conferencing a program on the computer. And we have a good time sharing things and laughing. And even though we're in a dozen or more locations, I feel more closely connected to them than I ever have. I've also been able to recognize goodness in places I hadn't, and I see opportunity where I really had missed it before. I now send the bulletin and the sermon in advance to a dozen or so people. Why have people who are in nursing homes who we never did that for before? But suddenly we are, and we're going to continue doing that. We're connecting in ways we had not connected before. 
God doesn't just show up when we start naming our pain and disappointment. But God allows us space to see that God was always there. And as we continue this time apart, I invite you to allow yourself and others to name that, to say, but we had hoped. Because it's okay to be disappointed that proms and graduations are being moved and canceled. It's okay to mourn and grieve whatever it is that's broken. And my prayer is that in the grieving, you have the space to experience God's grace and to see and walk with the risen Christ. Amen. We're walking the road to Emmaus in sadness and wearying fears. Our hopes have been dashed by an unseen assassin, our plans washed away in tears. Just like the one who had seen Jesus die, we stumble in cowering gloom, never expecting to live in his life, even though he was gone from the tomb. They heard a soft padding of footsteps, but never looked back to see. For their eyes had been closed by their unbelief, just the same as you and me. Then they asked this mysterious stranger to stop and have supper with them. Then this man blessed the bread and gave it to each one. Then they knew that the stranger was him. Now we're walking the road to Emmaus in our firm belief in his love. That our risen Savior, Jesus our Lord, sends down to us from heaven above sends love down from heaven above. Amen. Please join in the prayer of confession. We're afraid to take a truthful look at ourselves, yet you see us as we really are. Open our eyes, Lord. Even when we won't listen to you, you hear us when, you, when we call your name. Open our ears, Lord. We keep the light of your word hidden to ourselves, though you gave it to share with the world. Open our mouths, Lord. May we know and serve the one who calls us to see, hear, and speak. Open our hearts, Lord. Let us pray this Easter affirmation. Your light is the only light we need as we travel through life's mystery. Your word, the only voice we hear, that still small voice that leads us to the place where we should be. Your presence is the only company we need as we walk this narrow road. Your fellowship, the warmth we crave to help us on our way. May the truth of Easter, the joy of Easter, and the blessings of Easter be with us this day and all days. Amen. Amen.
Look for the many ways in which God has blessed your journey. Go in confidence that Christ walks with you each step of the way. Go in peace. Amen.